Hello, welcome to Economics 231 video final covering chapters 20, 21, 22, 23, 26, and we're not going to deal with 27. Uh, Merry Christmas. Um, make sure you watch the whole video. Do not skip ahead and make sure the video stops at the very end after the final set of questions. Okay, so once you're done answering the final set of questions, there could be a little time left over. Let it run. Let the uh, video stop on its own. If you skip ahead or you don't watch the whole video, you will not get credit. You will have to retake it again, and there's nothing I can do about it because there is no score kept in the system for you. Okay? You can take this as many times as you want, and I will only keep the highest score. You may have nothing in front of you except for a scratch, blank scratch paper, pen or pencil if you want. Okay? There's no need to cheat because you can take it over. All right? Not that anybody would. So, we are going to get through this as fast as possible. I'm thinking this video might take two hours, but I'm going to do my best not to. So, we're starting off with Chapter 20, How to Use an Aggregate Demand and Supply Model to Explain the Business Cycle. Okay. So, what is the aggregate demand curve? Okay, that is a curve that shows the level of real GDP purchased by consumers, and we abbreviate them with a C. Businesses, we abbreviate their spending with an I. Governments, we abbreviate their spending with a G. And foreigners, we call that net exports and abbreviate it with an NX. So it shows the level of real GDP purchased by consumers, businesses, governments, and foreigners at different possible price levels during a time period, Satyrus Paribus. We learned about those price levels in Chapter 17, and we learned about GDP in Chapter 15. Okay. Now, the vertical axis on the uh, aggregate demand, aggregate supply curve uh, is, deals with price levels, the prices of goods and services in the economy, and they use the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. The horizontal axis measures the value of final user goods and services included in real GDP measured in base years dollars okay that's real gdp also called real gdp okay now if you decrease the price level that makes goods and services more affordable to consumers businesses governments and foreigners so all other things being equal as the price level decreases that will cause an increase in the real gdp demanded by those groups if, on the other hand, the price level increases, say in the U.S., that would decrease the real GDP demanded. And when we take this and draw it on a graph, you can see here I've got the price level as measured by the CPI, that's the Consumer Price Index. Okay, that's on the y-axis. On the x-axis is real GDP in trillions of dollars. As the price level decreases, demand for domestic goods and services increases. So here, if this is the U.S. price level and it's at 300, and then it decreases, you can see here that more real GDP will be demanded by consumers, businesses, governments, and foreigners as that price level decreases. Okay, and that's your aggregate demand curve. You could think of this as if we were to imaginarily add up all of the demands for every single good or service, uh, final user good or service produced within the United States. So this would be the demand for chickens, plus the demand for coffee tables, plus the demand for iPhones, plus the demand for... Um, you know, Ruger 1022 rifles, everything that's produced within this country, we if we could, we'd add up all those demand curves, and that would be aggregate demand. Now, in reality, that's not possible, okay? So we suspend belief and pretend we could. And that becomes our aggregate demand curve. This is sort of the demand for everything in the economy, okay?
Now, why does it slope downward to the right? I'm just going to introduce these to you. The first one is called the real balances effect. The second reason is the interest rate effect. And the third is the net export effect. Okay? The real balances effect is that consumers spend more on goods and services because lower prices make their dollars more valuable. So if you make $50,000 a year and the price level drops, you can buy more with that $50,000. So you're going to buy more real GDP as the price level drops. The second reason is called the interest rate effects. And this assumes a fixed money supply. That, and if you have a fixed money supply, an increase in the price level increases borrowing demand and in turn higher interest rates, which discourage consumer spending. Okay, so think of this as a credit card, right? As prices increase, more borrowing takes place, and that rise it causes interest rates to go up. And if interest rates go up, instead of spending money, you'll put more money in the bank. Okay, you'll spend less as price levels go up. Okay, an intermediary effect there is the interest rates go up. The final thing is the net export effect. And this says that a higher domestic price level makes U.S. goods more expensive compared to foreign goods. As a result, exports decrease. Foreigners will buy less of our stuff because it's more expensive. And imports increase. We'll buy more foreign stuff because U.S. stuff is more expensive relative to it. So that will cause a decrease in real GDP through net exports component. And that net NX, NX is net exports, is equal to X minus M. So imports go down, imports go up. That's going to cause net exports to go down. And that's going to reduce um, the quantity demanded of real GDP if price levels go up. So those are the three reasons why we say that the, uh, the um, aggregate demand curve is downward sloping. Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is what can cause a shift in aggregate demand curve, okay? Any of the components of GDP, C, and the C here got messed up. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened here, but my C should be in here. There should be a C there. That's consumption spending plus I, investment spending. That's businesses buying final user goods and services. G, government spending, or net exports. Anything that causes these four things to change will cause a shift in the aggregate demand curve. Anything other than price levels. Okay. So if you get an increase in consumer spending, investment spending, government spending, or net exports, that will cause an increase in the aggregate demand curve. And that is a shift up and to the right. Any decrease in these, let's say consumers, right? Let's say um, consumers, uh, you know, interest rates go up on credit cards, so they're not going to spend as much money on, for Christmas, right? That would cause a decrease in government, excuse me, aggregate demand. And that is a shift to the left and down. So here is an original aggregate demand curve here, A. Let's say that, uh, oh, that that um, consumers spend uh, more money. They get big bonuses at Christmas that they weren't expecting. So that would cause an increase in consumer spending. So that would shift the curve to the right. Now, at any level, any given price level, consumers are willing, it, I mean, uh, excuse me, consumers, businesses, governments, and foreigners are willing and able to buy more U.S. goods and services at the same price level because everybody got a bigger bonus than they expected for Christmas. Okay, I won't get one because I don't get a Christmas bonus. It stays too cheap. All right, now we're going to look at these aggregate, this aggregate demand curve, and then bring in aggregate supply. When we look at at the assumptions of John Maynard Keynes, who uh, is the sort of the founder of modern mainstream economics, good as good or bad as it is. Okay, he made two crucial assumptions, and these two crucial assumptions affect the curves that we're going to look at. The first assumption that investment spending I 
is driven by animal spirits that it is irrational. This means that aggregate demand is directly related to animal spirits. And I know that's a ridiculous term. I never thought I'd get a PhD and have to run around saying animal spirits. But if I want to talk about Keynes, I have to, not that I want to. Okay? So Keynes thought that investment spending was irrational. It was driven by animal spirits. So you can sort of think of this as, you know, you get a little bad news and everybody goes into a funk and they won't invest. So their animal spirits are low, they won't invest. Or they get a little good news and they overreact and they spend too much. Okay, that would be positive animal spirits. And aggregate demand would decrease when animal spirits are low and increase, aggregate demand would increase when animal spirits are high. The other assumption that he makes is going to relate to the aggregate supply curve we're about to look at in a minute. Keynes thought that prices and wages were inflexible in the downward direction. Okay, I call this the Weebles Wobbles assumption. Prices and wages can go up, but they can't go down. Okay, and this determines the shape of the aggregate supply curve. All right, what you assume about prices and wages in these labor driven models determines the shape of an aggregate supply curve. You can think of that as sort of a, a, a summation of all the different supply curves that we talked about in chapter three in an economy. Not that we can actually add them together, but we suspend disbelief and pretend that we could add them together. And according to Keynes's assumptions, this would force the aggregate supply curve to take on a backward L shape for the classical Keynesian approach. His followers made up and drew these curves. Keynes never drew them. But he did make these assumptions in his ideas on economics. So what is the aggregate supply curve? You can think of this as a, an overall or general supply curve for an economy. It's the curve that shows the levels of real GDP, that's gross domestic product, produced at different price levels during a time period ceteris paribus, okay? And there are two opposing theories. There's actually more than two, but uh, the first one is the Keynesian view, which I just explained to you, this backward L-shaped curve. And then the second one is the classical view, where they assume that prices and wages uh, freely adjusted uh, instantly, and that results in a, a, a vertical classical, I mean, class, excuse me, uh, aggregate supply curve for the classicals. If they ever drew one, which they never did. All of this stuff was made up after Keynes and these classical economists came along. Who is John Maynard Keynes? Uh, he is was a famous Cambridge economist who wrote a book called The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, published in 1936. This was during the Great Depression, and in it, Keynes turned uh, modern turned macroeconomics up on its head. Instead of saying that business cycles were not inherent in capitalism, that they were caused by institutions outside the capitalist system, such as government central banks, fractional reserve commercial banks, and governments, Keynes comes along and says no, that business cycles are inherent in capitalism, and that we need these out institutions outside the capitalist system, governments, government central banks, and the fractional reserve banking system to counteract the excesses of capitalism. He follows Karl Marx in believing that business cycles were inherent in capitalism. The view prior to Keynes was that they were not. Okay. Now, what is the Keynesian view of this aggregate supply curve? When there is a severe recession, Keynes argued that a horizontal flat supply curve exists because product prices and wages are fixed or rigid. Okay, he assumed this. Okay, um, he uh, assumed that there were fixed product uh, product prices and wages because during a deep recession or a depression, there are idle resources in the economy. Okay, there's resources that could be being used to produce goods and services, but they're not. Okay. 
uh, he says that firms are willing to sell products at current prices because there are no shortages to put upward pressure on prices. Okay. Now, this is not entirely true, but it's basically true. Keynes favored fiscal policy over monetary policy, the use of government's uh, spending and taxing powers to achieve macroeconomic goals. He uh, said this worked better and faster than monetary policy. So Keynes believed that government spending must be used to increase aggregate demand and restore a depressed economy to full employment. And you see something like this when you look at the uh, New Deal, which had already begun to be passed before Keynes wrote the book. But the book seemed to fulfill what um, government uh, politicians and government uh, bureaucrats wanted to do anyway. So his book became famous and was adopted and became the foundation of modern macroeconomics. So if investment spending goes down, let's say bad animal spirits happen and businessmen go into a funk and they cut investment spending, that's going to cause aggregate demand to drop and that's going to cause a decrease in output, okay, according to Keynes, because prices and wages don't change. The only way to get out of that is to offset that drop in spending, investment spending, by increasing C, consumer spending, I, investment spending, G, government spending, or net exports by a corresponding amount. So the easiest way to do that, according to Keynes, was to have the government increase its spending. That this would uh, increase aggregate demand, and as we'll see in, the, in a minute, move the economy from being in a recession at E1 to point E2, and when this happens, according to Keynes, the price level remains constant while real GDP and employment rise. So we will look at that in a minute right now. Go ahead and take some time uh, and answer the following questions and the video will restart as soon as you are done. Okay, now, Here's that aggregate supply curve we talked about. This is the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. The economy always starts off at full employment. Okay, that's where uh, we have um, we have the economy has full employment, which means that we have no cyclical unemployment. If you remember that from chapter 16, so we have some we can have frictional, we can have seasonal, we can have structural unemployment. Those things always exist, but it's only during a recession that we get cyclical unemployment. So if cyclical unemployment exists, the economy is going to be producing less than the full employment amount of output. And that is uh, pretty much by definition a recession. A recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Okay, so that's going to shift us when we get the aggregate demand curve on here to the left. Okay, now here this would be the opposite of what I just talked about. According to Keynes, there is sort of a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. You can have one, but you can't have both. So here, this is the sweet spot in the Keynesian model. Here, we have an aggregate demand curve, the black one, that intersects right at the uh, corner of the backward L. And at this point, the economy has no price inflation. We have a price level of 100 using the CPI. And if we go straight down, the economy is at full employment. This is sort of the potential or maximum amount of output the economy can sustain. And this is a great spot. That's where you want to be. Now, let's say CIG or NX increase. And let's say it's G, that the government uh, decides to increase spending, say, by starting a war or a new social program. That increases aggregate demand. It shifts the aggregate demand curve from the black AD0 to the blue AD1. That's an increase in aggregate demand. Now, aggregate demand intersects 
the aggregate supply curve here. And if you look, output is still the same, but prices have risen, in this case, by 30%. So here, if you increase aggregate demand from this sweet spot, all that's going to do is result in price inflation, according to Keynes. Okay, Prices will go up and wages will go up. Prices and wages can always go up, but they can't go down. And we'll see in the next case what happens when aggregate demand decreases. I'm going to skip and go back. Here, the economy is at the sweet spot here, right? This is that nice equilibrium. No price inflation. The CPI is at 100. The economy is producing at full employment output. Everything's going well. And then here, let's say that animal spirits go down. Right, get some bad news, and the animal spirits of those irrational businessmen <coughs> decrease. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> and that causes them to cut their spending. That's a reduction in I, so that's going to reduce aggregate demand. And now the economy is at a new equilibrium here. Where the price level is still 100, price levels haven't changed, but we've got less output being produced, okay? And if we're producing less output, we need fewer workers to produce it. So now we've got unemployment going up as we get cyclical unemployment in the economy. So here, that's a bad thing. We don't want unemployment. The economy's in a recession or a bust. And that's caused by a decrease in aggregate demand. Okay, So if you get a decrease in aggregate demand, that's a bust or a recession, also called depressions, crises, panics. Okay, If we go back here, if you get an increase in aggregate demand above this sweet spot, that's just going to cause price inflation. You can think of that as the economy is just spinning its wheels. It's not getting anywhere. We're not getting more stuff out of it just prices and wages go up, okay? We buy the same amount of stuff, okay? Now, this was the dominant paradigm in the, in the, in the U.S. and most of the world until the 1970s. In the 1970s, we got something that Keynes and his friends said couldn't happen. We got stagflation. Stagflation was a case where the economy was in recession so output is over here to the left. Keynes would say we should not get price inflation along with it. Prices should stay the same. We get a decrease in aggregate demand. The economy just goes into a recession. But prices don't change. But at the same time that output decreases and we go into a recession, prices actually increase. So the economy operates up here. But there's no way to get an equilibrium right here with this Keynesian model. It is an impossibility according to the Keynesians, but it had happened in the 70s. Okay. When this happened, that threw macroeconomics into, into a crisis. We had an event that we couldn't explain, and if we tried to explain it, we'd have to say that it was impossible. So that changes macroeconomics after the 1970s, okay? So once again, increase in aggregate demand, that's going to cause price inflation. Output doesn't increase in the classical Keynesian model, just prices. If you get a decrease in aggregate demand, oops, I went, went the wrong way, okay? from AD1 to AD0 to AD1, that's going to cause a decrease in output, but Keynes said prices would stay the same because that decrease in demand should necessitate a fall in prices and wages, which would get us back to an equilibrium at full employment, but Keynes said that's not possible. He assumed it away. So because prices and wages don't adjust, a decrease in demand means consumers and, and governments and, and businessmen and foreigners buy less stuff, but we can't drop the prices in order to keep the same amount of output being produced. So we go into a recession and we have idle resources, labor being the main one.
and idle labor during a recession is called cyclical unemployment. Okay, we're going to stop, take a little time to answer exam questions, and then we will continue. The next thing we're going to talk about is the classical view of aggregate supply. Okay, the classical view says that prices and wages adjust instantly. So if aggregate demand decreases, the prices of the output could decrease 20% and people's wages would decrease 20%. So while wages decrease 20%, so do the prices of the things that, that workers buy, so they can still buy the same amount of stuff with their lower wages and the economy stays at full employment. It doesn't cause a recession. According to the classical economists, the economy normally operates at full employment GDP because markets will adjust in a short period of time without government intervention. So the classical said that if you go into a recession, the government should just stay out of it. Okay? They probably caused the problem and they should stay out of it and just let the market adjust, let prices and wages adjust, drop 20% each so that all of the output that the economy can produce will be both bought and sold and available to be bought and sold. Okay. <clears throat> As we said before, unlike Keynes, the classical economists believed in flexible prices and wages. A decrease in the aggregate demand curve creates a surplus of unsold goods. Firms cut their prices and lay off workers. Competition from unemployed workers reduces the wage rate. As prices fall, Consumers increase their spending downward along the aggregate demand curve according to the real balances effect. So aggregate demand decreases at full employment. That's going to cause unemployment. These workers now want jobs. They'll take jobs at lower wages. Okay. The unemployment causes a decrease in prices because I'm not working. My demand for things falls. That's going to cause a decrease in the price. Competition for jobs causes wages to fall. As wages fall, more people are, are employed in the economy, and the economy moves back towards full employment. So here is our aggregate supply curve. If prices and if, if aggregate demand drops, prices and wages just drop with it, and the economy stays at full employment. As you can see here. Okay. We start off at AD1, then we get a reduction <coughs> in aggregate demand at a price of 300, not all of the goods and services produced in the economy are demanded or people are willing and able to pay for them anymore. So that would cause a surplus, more goods and services to, to exist on the market than consumers, businesses, governments, and foreigners are willing to purchase. That would cause businesses to decrease the prices that they charge for real GDP, decreasing the price level. Um, at the same time, wages are falling because these unemployed workers here want jobs, so they drive wages down by an equal percentage, and the economy returns back to <coughs> <coughs> a full employment level of output. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> okay, now... Um, some people say that there is an intermediate range in the demand curve, aggregate supply curve, excuse me, I said demand, I meant aggregate supply, um, called an intermediate range, 
okay? And this is because of bottlenecks, obstacles to output flows developed because firms cannot fill orders and raise their prices. Labor shortages make wage increases. Wage increase demands difficult to reject, things like this. Production costs rise as firms use less skilled labor and machinery to fill orders, okay? We're not going to worry about this. If you look at the, the overall aggregate, aggregate supply curve that's drawn in your book, you have uh, what they call the Keynesian region where it's flat, an intermediate region where it's upward sloping, and then a vertical section they call a classical region. No one draws that curve, okay? It's just a teaching tool, and I don't think it's a good one. So we're not going to talk about this intermediate range very much, okay? Now we've got exam questions. Uh, answer <coughs> the questions. When you're done, we'll continue. Okay. Testing, testing. Okay, now we're going to look at something called the self-correcting aggregate demand and supply model. This is a model where we make a different assumption about prices and wages. And this has to do with um, the stagflation that we talked about before. Stagflation through that Keynesian paradigm into a uh, crisis. Okay, they couldn't explain why this was happening. Okay, it, it shouldn't. It was, it was viewed as being an impossibility. So that meant you had a problem with your theory. So here they come up with a new model, and this new model um, helps us gain an understanding of long-run equilibrium using a self-correcting aggregate demand aggregate supply model. So here we're going to allow the economy to self-correct. Okay, and they do this by adding another curve. So you have two curves that don't work, so you add a third. Okay, and I guess if this one doesn't work, they'll add a fourth. Okay, so we're adding a short run aggregate supply curve and we're going to change the shape of the long run ag aggregate supply curve with different assumptions. Okay, so here we have a short run aggregate supply curve. This is the curve that we're adding. And this is the short curve that shows the level of real GDP produced at different possible price levels during a period of time in which nominal incomes do not change in response to changes in the price level. Okay. Nominal incomes you can think of as the amount of money you receive on your paycheck. So that's not going to change. We're assuming that stays fixed. Okay. This curve is upward sloping because nominal wages and salaries, incomes, remain fixed in the short run as the price level changes. So if the price level decreases, okay, um, firms will supply fewer goods and services on the market, okay, if the aggregate price level increases, firms will supply more on the market, okay. So we have this upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve, okay. Because if prices go down, and incomes don't change what they pay workers, it's going to be less profitable to produce output, so they'll produce less of it. If price levels go up and wages don't change, out nominal income doesn't change, they pay the workers the same amount of money, profits will increase, so the firms will produce more output on the market. That's why it's upward sloping. And there are different versions of this, but we're sticking with this one because it's the one the textbook uses. Okay, so uh, we got a short question on this, and then we will uh, get back to work. Welcome back. Now we're going to look at uh, the other curve we talked about, the long run aggregate supply curve. We had this before, we just called it the aggregate supply curve. Now we're putting the word long run in front of it <clears throat> and we're changing the shape of it. We will no longer have that Keynesian backward L. Instead, it will be a vertical straight up and down curve like the classical supply curve. 
Okay, so the long-run aggregate supply curve is the curve that shows the levels of real GDP produced at different possible price levels during a period in which nominal incomes change by the same percentage as the price level changes. So here, okay, at some point in time when price levels change, eventually incomes will catch up. So if prices go up by 20%, at some point in time, wages will catch up, or incomes, actually incomes, which are derived from wages. Incomes will catch up, and they'll go up by 20%. And the same thing if, if prices drop by 20%, eventually in the long run, okay, wages will drop by 20% with them. But it takes time. And the amount of time it takes is the difference between the short run and the long run. And it is a vertical curve because in the long run, sufficient time has elapsed for labor contracts to expire and wages and salaries to be renegotiated. Okay, so that's how it, why it takes longer time for wages to adjust and catch up with prices is because of labor contracts. Okay, this is one of the assumptions in the model. And when we assume, we know what happens. So here's that long run aggregate supply curve, vertical, up and down, at full employment. That's the key point here. Okay. So in the long run, the economy will always return to full employment output. Okay. So if we have a recession and output is lower, the natural tendency of the economy will be to return back to full employment. How long that takes is a question that is not answered. Okay, some people think it takes a long time and they say we should enter the government should intervene in the economy by boosting aggregate demand. Say it was down here. Okay, by boosting aggregate demand and that will get us back faster than waiting for wages to adjust. So in the long run, increases in aggregate demand only cause an increase in prices. That's in the long run. They will cause temporarily a boom to occur, but that boom will self-correct as wages increase. I'm sorry, excuse me, that'll be a recession. Um, wait, my fault. As aggregate, if aggregate demand increases, that will cause a boom, okay? But, as wages start to increase, supply will decrease and we'll move back towards real GDP. And in the long run, aggregate demand equal, sorry, equals aggregate supply equals, I'm going to draw my, my graph here. Let me draw that. There we go. So in the long run, these curves are, these are not straight, but there we go. In the long run, right here, where all three curves intersect, aggregate demand, the upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve, and the long run aggregate supply curve all intersect here, and that's a long run equilibrium. Okay, thank you. Answer a quick question or two. And we'll be good. How do I get out of this? Thank you. Okay, welcome back. So we're going to finish that self-correcting aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And where aggregate demand increase, inc excuse me, intersects both the vertical long run aggregate supply curve and the short run aggregate supply curve, that is a long run equilibrium. Here's a better version of what I tried to draw on the earlier slide. Okay, here's that aggregate demand curve in the blue. Okay, that's determined by C plus I plus G plus NX, consumption spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus net exports.
Long run aggregate supply curve. This is a period of time during which nominal wages do not adjust. Prices can change, but wages can't, at least not in the short run. And then in the long run, prices and wages adjust. Okay, Wait, wages or nominal income catches up with prices. Okay, where these three curve intersects, that is a long run equilibrium. An increase in aggregate demand. Okay. The impact of an increase in long run aggregate demand, the short run aggregate supply curve shift leftward as nominal incomes rise because firms are competing for labor when the economy operates beyond full employment. So this happens after the demand curve shifts. Nominal incomes start to catch up to price changes. Okay. Over time, the economy self-corrects to a higher price level at full employment GDP. Okay. Take time to answer one quick question, and then we'll be back. Welcome back. Okay. So here, this is the process, and then I'm going to show you using some graphs. So you get an increase in aggregate demand. That causes an increase in the price level and real GDP, so we get a boom. Now, the problem here is initially nominal incomes don't go up. So firms are bringing in more money in revenue because of the higher price levels, but they don't have to pay increases in costs, say wages. That causes eventually as union contracts and labor negotiating contracts expire and get renegotiated that causes nominal incomes later to start to catch up to price changes and that shifts the short run aggregate supply curve to the left that's a reduction in short run aggregate supply and that returns the economy back towards a long run equilibrium to look at it here okay we get an increase. Here's our initial equilibrium. Price levels are at 100. The economy's at full employment. Everything is sweet and wonderful. Then we get an increase in aggregate demand. Say, say uh, business spending increases due to an increase in animal spirits, right? So businesses are spending more money on investment, right? That would cause aggregate demand to increase. And initially, prices go up, but nominal wages stay the same. So we operate here on this red short run aggregate supply curve and the economy moves from E1 to E2. More output is produced but prices have gone up. Now this is nice we'd like to have more output but this isn't sustainable okay. We would get employment unemployment levels much lower than full employment okay if that makes sense say full employment we have five percent unemployment then we get an increase in aggregate demand that is going to cause prices to go up but initially wages or nominal incomes don't adjust for that so now businesses make more profits and we move to E2. Unemployment drops below 5%. Say here it's 3%. That's not sustainable. Okay. And eventually, oops, wages will start to increase. That's going to decrease the short run aggregate supply curve. And eventually, we'll return to a new long run equilibrium where this new short run aggregate supply curve which reflects the higher price level it now crosses the long run aggregate supply curve at the same point that the at new aggregate demand curve ADU2 crosses and that becomes our new long run equilibrium. And as long as there are no changes, the economy will stay at that new 
equilibrium at E4. Now, on the other hand, what happens if aggregate demand decreases? So let's say businessmen get some bad news and um, um, they go into a funk and their animal spirits are now low. What happens to the economy? That decrease in spending would cause prices to fall. But nominal incomes are sticky or they take time for them to adjust so they stay the same. So businesses are bringing in less money as revenue but paying out the same cost in wages. That would cause their profits to decline, okay, and cause a decrease in the amount of output they produce. When this happens, the economy goes into a recession. But over time, as those wage contracts and labor contracts start to get renegotiated and wages adjust, so they start to decrease along with prices, nominal incomes fall, businesses start to become more profitable, so they start to produce more output, and they'll hire back unemployed workers, okay, who are pushing downward on the wages. Over time, this, the economy self-corrects to a lower price level at full employment real GDP. So let's look at that. Okay. Now remember, this takes time. So decrease in aggregate demand, that's going to decrease the price level and real GDP. The economy is going to go into a recession. Over time, wages will start to fall to catch up with prices. As that happens, businesses become more profitable and the short run aggregate supply curve shifts to the right. And when wages have caught up to prices, we get a new long run equilibrium. And here it is, we're using the graph. So here's our initial equilibrium. All of a sudden, we get a decrease in aggregate demand. The economy moves from E1 to E2. At E2, that's a short run equilibrium. Prices have dropped from 200 to 150, and output has decreased from $8 trillion to $4 trillion. Now, at this point, wages or, or nominal incomes haven't changed. But over time, as those union contracts get renegotiated, nominal wages start to decrease. More workers are hired back into the economy, and that shifts the short-run aggregate supply curve to the right. We move from E2 to E3, and eventually back to a new long-run equilibrium at E4. Okay, You can see here, we have the same amount of output, $8 trillion, which is the full employment output for this economy, but the price level has dropped from an initial level of 200 to 150 to 125 and down here to 100. Now these numbers are, are just there for, for, for example's sake, okay? But prices drop in the long run, output stays the same. In the short run, prices and real GDP drop. This is our recession from E1 to E2 and then back until we get to E3, E2, sorry, E2 to E4 is our recovery. So our conclusion here is that a rightward shift of the long-run aggregate supply curve represents economic growth in potential full employment real GDP. Okay, so if the long-run aggregate supply curve shifts, okay, that's the, the straight up and down one, that's going to cause a increase. That's going to be caused only by increases in my fault here. I went the wrong way. Okay, cause only cause increases in potential full employment real GDP. So here, let's say we we increase this curve, the long run aggregate supply curve. Pretend that's straight from LRAS to LRAS prime here. And I, I don't have a way to write letters nicer than that. Okay, that's an increase in potential GDP. Those are the things that we talked about in chapters 2 and 30. Things that cause that are things that cause um, 
real growth in the economy, uh, increases in the quantity and or quality of the real factors of production that fit into the structure of production that um, that produce what they produce, the marginal value of what they produce is, is greater than the marginal cost. Those types of things cause real growth and all these curves shift over to the right when that happens. Okay, and that's permanent. Okay, now the other thing I want to talk about here is that stagflation. Okay, here we have an economy, AD is our initial demand curve. The black SRAS curve is our initial short run aggregate supply, and the black vertical long run aggregate supply curve is, is our, our, our LRAS. And we're operating in a long run equilibrium. Okay. The way the reason this model comes into being is because the Keynesians couldn't explain stagflation. They couldn't say, why does the economy go into a, a price inflationary recession? That's impossible. Well, this curve. That's adding this short run aggregate supply curve allows economists in the mainstream to explain stagflation. They say, oh, some kind of a shock to the system, something that causes short run aggregate supply curve to decrease goes on, say an increase in the price of oil. That's how they tried to explain the 1970s stagflation. They said OPEC uh, had its embargo against the West where they wouldn't sell oil to the West. That drove the price of a key resource, oil, up. And that decreased the short-run aggregate supply curve. Now, businesses were making less profit, so they moved, output moved from point A to point B here. You can see from A to B, price levels went up, output is now below, full employment. The economy is in a recession and prices are going up at the same time. That's why they call it stagflation. The, the reduction in output is stagnation in the economy and the inflation part is for price inflation. Okay, When that happens, nominal incomes don't change. But over time, Okay, over time, um, this short run aggregate supply curve will shift back as wages decrease, nominal incomes decrease, and bring us back to point A. So we go from A to B to A, assuming no intervention in the economy. Now, a lot of economists would say, oh, but that takes time. In fact, it takes a lot of time. Therefore, we need to have government interventions to get the economy back to full employment faster. In that case, if we're stuck here at B for a long time, economists would say, well, to get back to full employment output, we can manipulate aggregate demand, maybe by increasing government spending, say on new social programs or through um, automatic stabilizers in the economy or uh, through lower interest rates to increase investment spending or through lower taxes to increase consumer spending. And that will push aggregate demand from AD to AD1 here, the blue aggregate demand curve. And that will bring us back to a new long run equilibrium here at point C. Now that only works if the government can magically assume how much they need to increase spending by to get this imaginary curve to match up with these two others, not overshoot or undershoot. Another thing that happens is this adjustment would have to happen before nominal incomes start to adjust. So if nominal incomes start to adjust faster than the policy is implemented and works, this short run aggregate supply curve will have decreased down here. And instead of getting a return to full employment, maybe we start a new boom, right? Okay. <clears throat> also, if we intervene, in the long run, prices will be higher while we'll price inflation. Now, this affects certain people more than others. Those groups include 
retired people, anybody on a fixed income, retired people, pensioners, um, people who are living on accident settlements like disabled people, uh, um, believe it or not, um, um, my brain has gone on me, orphans, okay, orphanages, a lot of orphanages that are privately owned and they get a fixed income every month from investments. So if prices go up here like 35%, right, they have the same amount of money coming in. They can support fewer uh, orphans or the orphans have to go from eating nice healthy food to eating porridge every day. So people who are on fixed incomes get hurt the most by price inflation. So correcting the economy here well, even if it could speed up and we could get it done before other adjustments go on and get to point C, it's still going to hurt people because now we're going to have pro higher prices. Okay, and they're gonna, their incomes, those people on fixed incomes, are going to be able to earn less. Short question and answer, and then we will get back to work. Welcome back. Now, what can cause increases in the short in the long run aggregate supply curve? Changes in resources, right? Increases in land labor technology, increases in the quantity and or quality of them, uh, an advance in technology. Okay, and you can see here over time, as long run aggregate supplies curves increase, say to due to increased technology, that the economy moves from point to point to point, and prices went up. And so did output in real GDP terms. Okay. When we look at economic growth between 1995 and 2000, 1995, the economy was below its full employment potential. Over the five years, the economy grew to uh, full employment with mild inflation. Technological change and capital accumulation caused economic growth in potential real GDP terms. Aggregate demand increased as these people made higher incomes and short run aggregate supply curve increased along with it. And that was that little picture we saw here. Okay, so that's what they're saying happened over 2000, 1995 to 2000. Okay. Okay. You see here, that's another version of it. Okay, take some time, answer these short questions, and we'll come back. Welcome back. Now, here we're going to be looking at uh, chapter, I believe it's 26. And how do we correct for these things? Once we've got, say, a recession, and you believe that it's necessary for the economy to, the government to come in and intervene in the economy to get us back to full employment. How do you do this? Okay. And the way Keynes advocated doing it, or his main advocation was through fiscal policy. This is in contrast to monetary policy. Fiscal policy is the deliberate use of changes in government spending or taxes to alter aggregate demand. Okay, so we can change government spending or tax policy to cause changes in CIG or NX and affect aggregate demand. The first type of policy, fiscal policy we have is something called expansionary fiscal policy. We can increase government spending. We can decrease taxes. We can increase government spending and taxes equally, and this is due to the different uh, multipliers. Uh, government spending and increasing government spending is one for one. If we increase taxes at the same time, not every dollar taxed would have gone to consumption. Some of that would have been saved. So. For every dollar increase in, in government spending, we get a $1 increase in aggregate demand or the effect of that. But taxes, for every dollar we tax away from people, they only would have spent 90 cents of it. So a dollar in taxes only decreases aggregate demand by 90 cents. And then we turn around and spend that dollar. 
that increases aggregate demand by a dollar. Okay. Taxes typically affect businesses and consumers when we alter them. So these affect C and oops, I'm sorry, C and I, and this obviously affects G when we talk about um, aggregate demand. On the other hand, there's something called contractionary fiscal policy. Contractionary fiscal policy is where the government wants to decrease aggregate demand. So we can decrease government spending that lowers G, which is part of C plus I plus G plus NX. So that would lower aggregate demand. We can increase taxes, which would lower C and or I, depending upon what types of taxes we increase. Or we can decrease government spending and taxes equally. And again, we can do both at the same time here because the effect of government spending is larger than the effect of taxing when it comes to aggregate demand. And that's because consumers don't spend all of their money, they save some. So if I take a dollar away from someone, they would have only spent 90 cents of that. Then the government spends the whole dollar. You get a 10 cent net increase in aggregate demand, assuming that these multipliers are accurate. You get an increase in government spending or a decrease in taxes, that's gonna increase your aggregate demand curve. Or if you decrease both, Okay, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's going to increase aggregate, or if you increase both. So it's going to increase aggregate demand, and that's going to increase the price level and real GDP. Here is a little diagram here. We have an initial economy and recession. This is more like the Keynesian version than what we've been looking at. You increase aggregate demand, and that will cause prices to go up and the economy to return back to full employment when you're in a recession. So here we're using expansionary fiscal policy. Once again, we're using expansionary fiscal policy to combat a recession. So here we might have increased government spending, started some new social program. Uh, also, we have automatic stabilizers that kick in when the economy goes into recession. More welfare payments go out, more unemployment payments go out. Um, Taxes are lowered, right, because uh, people's incomes went down. It drops them into lower tax rates. That lowers their taxes. These could all be examples of expansionary fiscal policy to get us from AD1 to AD2, and that moves the economy from E1 to E2, okay? But you'll see an increase in prices and an increase in output back to full employment output. And the economy moves out of a recession. So we use expansionary fiscal policy to get us out of a recession. Okay. Go ahead and answer your questions here, and we will get started right back up.